How does one get scratched in the face by a turkey when you're well, killing it? Well, first of all, I wasn't a, the, I, in, in the process of this, I, what I do with when I did. Have you ever tried? No. I, do you know? I, I can't remember. I may, I may have made an alibi. Well, I. Um, do I need an alibi? Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. If you're smart, you will subscribe to the behavior panel. All right. You ready? Good. There. Here we go. I'm Scott Rasmo, body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. Did 20 years in the U.S. military. I'm number one best-selling author of four books on behavior profiling, body language analysis, persuasion, and influence. I train intelligence operatives and to the general public. You can find out more about those courses at chasehughes.com. Greg? Greg Hartley, former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together this number one body language tactics at bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. Excellent. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about a guy named Ian Bailey, and Ian is accused of murdering a woman in Ireland. And I, I think he's been found guilty in absentia, from what I understand. But as we go through these, here's what's happening. Here's what's going to go on. We're going to show you videos, and we're going to tell you what we see in the behavior we're showing in those videos. That's all we're doing. We don't care if this guy is innocent. We don't care if this guy is guilty. We could not possibly care less, and we don't know. So we're just telling you what we see in this guy's body language. That's it. We're not saying he's guilty or innocent or he did or didn't do it. So that's what we got. So, Greg, uh, give us a little background on the videos. Yeah, so um, there, there are several out right now. So if you were to go to Netflix, there's one called um, Sophie. If you go to Sky, there's one called Murder at the Cottage. There was also another one on Irish TV. So there are a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in this case. Um, the woman was named Sophie Toscan Duplantier, I believe, and she was a film producer out of France. She was on holiday or living part time in West Cork, and she was murdered a couple of days before Christmas. This guy was accused. He's been in court a couple of times. He's been arrested a couple of times, and Mark's going to give you more of the details of the case. But it's a pretty horrific case for a place that has not had that kind of crime in memory. So it became a very hot topic. It's all over the place right now. The original, for me, the original genesis of looking was someone direct messaged me on Twitter and said, look at this case. And, and of course, Scott's wife and my wife are both like, yeah, look at that case. So here we go. Mark, you want to talk about the legal issues and what's going on? Yeah, so here are the facts. 2019, Ian Bailey is convicted in absentia. It means he wasn't there for the court appearance. It was the French criminal courts, and he was convicted of voluntary homicide. According to the French, he is, uh, he committed voluntary homicide and he's, he has a 25 year sentence. He couldn't be extradited because the High Court of Ireland overturned that extradition for a whole bunch of convoluted reasons. None of those reasons being that they thought he was or was not guilty or innocent, had nothing to do with that. So the French uh, courts, as far as they're concerned, he is on the run uh, right now. He's a fugitive right now. He, Ian Bailey, maintains his innocence around that. These are the facts as I understand it. All right. All right. There's a little background, background for you. And you guys ready? Yeah. Yep. Here we go. You would be happy to surrender yourself to the Irish authorities to stand trial in this country. I this would party. welcome it. I mean, it seems like a very strange thing to, for an individual to be saying, I would welcome it. Try me for murder. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so it feels to me, uh, from what I'm seeing from his eyes, that these the idea of these questions are not new for him. I think he's prepared for this. He's very direct with his eye contact throughout his answering. So I think he's kind of practised these answers. Uh, he's very controlled about those answers. However, his breathing rate is actually quite high. So he comes across pretty confident around this. Breathing says to me there's a, a little edge of anxiety anxiety, a little edge of nerves, uh, almost panic around this. Uh, now, confident around welcoming some kind of trial. I don't know whether you've any, spent any time in a, in a court. Certainly, I've spent some time in courts. You want to avoid them at all costs. There's nothing nice about it. There's nothing good about about being in a in a court. I would say, so that he's welcoming this idea of hey, you know, put me up for murder. I'll go for it. It's kind of an odd stance uh, to take. I would say, so it feels very confident. Breathing pattern says something else, and he's got an an odd attitude about going to court, I would say, inviting it in. I don't quite get that. Uh, Chase, what do you got for me? Totally agree with you, Mark. And one of the things that we see that deviates from his baseline, and there are some great video of truthful baseline of him on the internet, which I reviewed today. One of the things that deviates a lot is immediate mouth closure after a statement. So he makes a statement and the lips immediately shut down, which is uncommon to begin with, but it's very uncommon uh, versus his baseline. And the blink rate goes down to a zero while he's answering the question. And our blink rate pretty much drops drastically in response to valuable things that we find interesting and things that are potentially threatening to our life. So what we see here is focus. We're focused on valuable things. We're focused on threats. So focus lowers how often we blink. And we see that here. His breathing rate is up to 45 in this. Mark, you, you noted that. And just to give you an idea, normal breathing rate is probably below 18. And this is per minute. And he's breathing into his chest, not his abdomen. If you ever watch a baby sleeping, You'll see the belly that rises and falls, any human sleeping, because that's what we do when we're relaxed, when we know that there's there's not a potential threat. Granted, of course, there's somebody questioning him, if somebody questioning me for a murder that I didn't do, I would still feel stressed. So please keep that in mind. And he had a small head shake. And this is different than a negation versus confirmation head shake. So when someone says, I loved working there, I didn't take any of that money. So they know that they're going to finish with a negation. But when it's just a positive statement with a, a no head shake, that becomes a red flag for me. Uh, the right side upward shoulder creep uh, toward the end there. I thought that was interesting. It's, it's only a two, according to you know, my research on the, on the behavioral table of elements. Uh, but that's just kind of, I think, this part of the body protecting an artery, which is a, a sign of potential fear there. Uh, his score, according to the behavioral table of elements, is an 18, and you need a score of 11 or higher to be likely deceptive. Uh, Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to go a little differently, I, but all the same things you guys said, how they all tie together. First of all, this guy's self-aggrandizing is my guess. Mark, he's saying, yeah, I would welcome it. And people don't usually do that. When we think about Maslow, Maslow says we need to belong and then we create esteem. Well, this guy's trying to create esteem by saying people wouldn't usually do that. It has nothing to do with whether he's guilty or innocent. It simply says, look at me. Here's who I am. I can see it in him. I can see it in his face. He's doing the, what Scott and I call the romance or in the true crime thing where he's making solid eye contact, Chase, to your point. And so his eyes are open. There's no blink rate. He's paying attention. He's looking exactly what you do. He goes into this whole, I'm different. But when he says, I would welcome it, absolutely, watch what he does. Watch blink rate go up just a bit. His respiration goes up. And then he does that that uh, quick eye block and does the shake head no, as he's saying absolutely. That all together is a cluster of behaviors. And like Chase said, he gives him an 18. I just give him a target on his forehead because he just did that. And he's in a bind now. The last thing I would say, if I were interrogating this guy, I would just bond him down to make him into an average guy because I would just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're really cool and all that. To me, you look like an out of work 
writer and and just push them down and watch what you get. So that's what I see. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, Mark. We're seeing a little bit of panic in there because he starts answering before the question is even finished being asked. He's waiting to get that thing out. That's when he's preloaded. I don't think he said it out loud before because the 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 uh, delivery is a little bit odd. It's a little bit off the, at that point. Also, I think that quick shoulder pop is just an expenditure of energy. He's 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 all geared up and things are starting starting to tie up. He's tie, uh, tighten up. He's breathing heavy, and as he's doing that, it's not because some shoulder thing goes off. I think he doesn't know what to do. He's trying to control himself. So that that's what I think that's about. And the whole time, this whole answer in this whole video, he blinks two times. That's it. That's pretty low, you know. But again, when somebody's asking you questions like that, your brain says we got to keep an eye on this guy and, or girl and, and make sure that they're they don't suspect us. I got to see what's happening and get this whole question right. So that's one of the that's one of the reasons that, that his eyes are are so locked in like that. He's not blinking a whole lot. Um, again, that word absolutely seems to always pop up when we're talking about somebody being murdered and they're talking about how they didn't do it. They say, absolutely not. I would, it's it just, just an odd word to, I never use the word. Absolutely. I absolutely never use it, <laughs> but, uh, but it's odd when it comes up in those, in those spots, it seems like most every time and you guys covered everything else. All right. We're good. One thing I did leave oh. out. If I were going to be in front of an audience and I'm worried about fight or flight, I would pick a different tie, not something that draws your eyes because you can see his respiration rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his, his yeah. heart pounding. So, yeah. Well, as smart as he thinks he is, I don't think he can, I don't think he would think that way. You know, we won't get into the uh, intricacies of that. But. Uh, he will later. <laughs> yeah, he will later. <laughs> All right, here we go. You would be happy to surrender yourself to the Irish authorities to stand trial in this country. I this would party. welcome it. I mean, it seems like a very strange thing to, for an individual to be saying, I would welcome it. Try me for murder. Absolutely. Uh. At first, he'd said he'd slept all night. Then he said he got up in the middle of the night to write. I had a story deadline for the Monday morning. I part written the story and I'd researched it but i hadn't finished it at some point during the night i left the bed came down to the kitchen table and i hand wrote the story so and then i went back to bed all right greg what do you got so there's one screaming glaring thing here that we talk about all the time and i think joe navarro came up with it first and schaefer jack schaefer joe navarro and they called it verbal bridging and then you never ever leave that alone if a person says and then you go hold on a second do the Colombo thing and backtrack them a little bit, do a backward timeline. The other thing that is interesting here, and there's not body language, we're not looking at body language. The other piece that's interesting here is too much detail, but not, not the chaff and redirect kind, what I call predictive storytelling. I'm only gonna tell you what I think I need to tell you to get my point across. And I'm gonna think about the reasons why I would go down there and do it. And so he's he's got a why, he's got a what he did. I had handwritten it the night before. Well, that when you say I'd handwritten it, that's because his typewriter is somewhere else. And he couldn't say, I had done it, I'd typewritten something. So he's giving you information that's pertinent to him getting his story that he did it while he was there and then went back to bed. For me, that's a red flag. Doesn't mean he's lying, but that and then is always an opportunity for somebody to hide something. It's just the way it is. Chase, what do you got? Absolutely agree with you. I think there is some uh, unusual stuff going on here. And I think this is a great clip uh, that, that you picked, Greg. That, that shows that we have to do a statement analysis here. There's no, there's no body language, there's no behavior. So we get a chance not just to analyze it, but to teach you uh, what we're seeing, so to speak, in this clip. I think it, when he says, at some point I left the bed, no one, even uh, weird English people like Mark, would say, I left the bed. We would say, I got out of bed. I got out of bed. Left the bed is a statement you would expect to hear from a witness, from another person. And that is an unusual thing. We're hearing something that belongs to another person or that is desired to be said by another person. And this suggests an alibi creation. And he's telling it from another POV a little bit. And in all likelihood, it was I slept through the night. Then it was I got up for 30 minutes. And then it was, I think, well over nine hours that, that he was missing. So that's interesting. 
and there's there's hiding some time in there like just like greg said absolutely agree with you there it's just did this and then i went back to bed uh scott yeah, I think the I think the verbal bridging there is is a like you were saying, Greg, classic man. I mean, that's great. That should be used in examples. Um, uh, to give that as an example, that it's perfect. It's perfect because if someone is, if you say uh, so, you went if you even if you talk to someone who is who's been stealing candy from a store, you know your kid or somebody else, you say, so "What'd you do?" Well, I didn't do. It. I didn't do it. it. wasn't me. We over to I was at the potato chips. I went over to the um, batteries. And, and then after that, I went over to the candy thing. I looked at it, and, and then we left. Really? So what? That, there's so many and thens, and thens, all these little places where you go back and, and you say, like you were saying earlier, Greg, we call this micro interrogations, little, little micro interviews. You get into that and then, and you talk about everything that happened between when this happened and then that happened, that little bridge of stuff right there. It's This one is incredible. And it's so, when you smell and you know it, this is one that tells you that automatically. That's that gut feeling you get. You say, something's not right here. That's one of those triggers that, that fire that off. So that's all, that's all I'll say about it. You guys covered most of it. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so once you've gone through that verbal bridging as well, you get a, a vocal click at the end of it, a little sound from him, which always suggests to me there's some tr stress, there's some pressure, there's some kind of problem with what was just said there uh also i think he tries to put some stress on monday morning in order to kind of bridge and take us right through to monday morning i think there's a stressful idea around you know kind of saying there's a deadline involved so so let's really just brush over that because the important thing is the article i was writing for monday morning now because he puts stress on that word monday morning we get something of of an accent from him, a very different accent. And we get in the in the Monday part of it, we get his northern accent coming out, north of England accent coming out. Now, hang on to that idea because it's important because later on, we're going to hear some accent changes from him. And, and that's kind of interesting, I would suggest, from personality point of view of what's the kind of person we may well have here who moves from accent to accent. Uh, you know, what kind of person might we have with those kind of behaviors? But really, uh, great, great catch there on the, ver uh, the, the bridging there. Click there just puts the icing on the cake for me. There we go. Yeah. I think this is another reason we should have Peter Hyde on here as a guest one time. I think so too. Can you imagine that? That would be great. Oh. He would have, yeah, this would be perfect for him. I think all the, all, all we'd learn from that guy. Yeah. So, love anyway. to have him anyway. It'd be great. Yeah. Just reach out to him. Yeah. At first, he'd said he'd slept all night. Then he said he got up in the middle of the night to write. I had a story deadline for the Monday morning. I'd part written the story and I'd researched it, but I hadn't finished it. At some point during the night, I left the bed, came down to the kitchen table, and I hand wrote the story. So, and then I went back to bed. Okay. <clears throat> How does one get scratched in the face by a turkey when well, you're first of all, I wasn't, a, I, in, in the process of dis, I, what I do with, when I did do the turkeys in, as it were, uh, I put their feet into a little loop and hung them from a, a hook in the shed. And in doing so, as I was trying to get the feet into the hook, one of the, the, the feet uh, just sort of ground, glanced across the top of my head, but it, that was not on my face. It was in my hairline. And it wasn't a particularly, um, it was a, a light scratch. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I could hog this and go first, but I won't. Chase, what do you got? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna cover these briefly. So I'll, I'll say one thing that we see here is a deviation from baseline like crazy. Now I'm gonna give you a list of everything that's changed. I'm not gonna tell you what it means. I'll let these guys do it. But here's what deviated from his baseline in order: speed, cadence, eye movement internal dialogue movement, uh, blink rate, and breathing location and speed. That's chest versus abdomen and how fast he's breathing. And the increase in speed is a big tell, is one of the biggest tells I've seen in my days. I like how the 
interviewer, the reporter asked the question, how does one do this instead of how did you? It helps to distance. It helps a more honest answer. It helps the likelihood that a more honest answer is coming. I'm going to pass it around to everybody here. What's one question or tactic that you would have used in this scenario or any of these scenarios? I would have personally liked to do the punishment question uh, towards the end of this of what do you think should happen to the person that did this? especially to his personality type, I think it would respond uh, really well. Uh, Scott, what would you say? I would be quiet right after that. As soon as he finished that, I would just keep looking at him and just keep waiting and waiting and waiting. Chase, I didn't write the words down. I was, I was getting ready to write all the words out. And Amber said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing all the words. She said, Chase is going to do that. So he didn't do it. <laughs> You got it. Oh, yeah, good. Chase. <laughs> I was waiting for you to read them because you usually come out with it. And I've written down exactly. Here's what he said. And you go off of the word. So I didn't do it because I was informed that you would be doing know. it. Anyway, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So, uh, number one, Mike, I'm, I'm you. I'd be silent. I would wait because, and he does because we'll see it in the next in the next segment. But I will say those turkeys can be rough. You know, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so if I if I, I I'm gonna go ahead and hop into mine, I guess, and then we'll just go around. Yeah. Yeah, okay, man. So, uh, cadence. First thing I have on there is cadence. This is a guy who prides himself on use of language. He stood and delivered poetry in the pub, even if people didn't want to hear it. So his spoken language is his art. His ability to use language is his art. And it suddenly goes away, and he turns into what I call worm on a griddle. If you turn off the sound and watch him, he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff, like he's glitching. And he points to his head. He illustrates three times to his head to get the point across. But he goes up at his hairline. You know, don't have one. But if you watch him, he goes away from that carefully metered language, and then he starts going just all over the place. And the reason is because he goes into what I always refer to as cat brain. He's now in a bind. He now has all those stress hormones dumped in and his brain is editing faster than he can speak. And so he gets in a real bind. If you watch the thing that causes him the most pain is trying to avoid the word kill. When he tries to avoid the word kill, you're going to see all kinds of stuff break loose in him. Uh, and then finally, as he's telling you the story, he shakes his head no and turns away. If you listen, then you'll hear a pause for after he says, after I did the turkeys in, he pauses mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. inhales heavily. So there you go. Watch him. He's a mess. <laughs> did I make, did I make my dancing got to you? <laughs> this is the worm on a griddle dancer. Oh, my God, dude. That? What happened? Oh, God. Chase, because you were starting, it started me going. Sorry, you almost man. got me. I was, like, I, was trying, oh, man. I was trying not to think of it, and then I thought of someone making it into a GIF. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't bother me. I was thinking about how I'm going to put it at the end of this thing. You know how I have that yeah. little short thing, and then it has somebody doing something? Yeah. yeah. That's Wouldn't right. that be funny? That's right. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so it is a beautiful question, and it's so beautiful in the Irish accent as well you know how do you how does one get scratched by a turkey <laughs> just a beautiful beautiful thing uh and and what does he come up with it's a word salad and a gesture stew to go with it because everything is so very indirect both in his gestures and his words and when he does become direct then his gestures become repetitious. But to your point, Greg, of three times he goes through his head. Once he's got something direct, he's like, oh, uh, let, me, let me show you th three times about that. So it's a complete, complete mess. Yeah, I think, you know, to, to your idea there, uh, Chase, of what are good questions in this situation, I think you can, as, as the guys are saying, you can go have no question at all, go silent and let them say even more or ask them for more detail. I might go, so how, so, so what kind of knot do you use when you're hanging up the turkeys? And, and then again, find out again so I can see whether I can get that panicked state uh, again. Tell me more about the turkeys. Go more in depth to see to, to just increase the rate of, of panic and, and the gymnastics that the brain is clearly having to do. And at then some point, give them an easy question to answer. 
which is the one that you really want the information on because the brain in a panic, once it gets something to hang on to, then it might just start delivering stuff. It, it, wouldn't, it didn't think it was going to deliver to you. There, that's what I got for you on that one. All right. Well, you remember the, the, the way back in the uh, 30s and 40s, those black and white films where they'd have some guy come in and they've thrown a bunch of marbles on the floor and he gets from point A to point B, but he's doing all this stuff like Greg was doing to get from here to there. That's what's happening with this guy when he's telling his when he's telling his story in that he gets ahead of himself. He gets back behind himself. He's trying to balance. It, he's trying to think what I say. This is I know I'm always focusing on this, but this is another case of him having the idea of what happened in his head without saying it out loud first perfect example of that so apparently no he's he's thought of this but hadn't really act, actually mm -hmm. put it out into the world yet so all right we good yeah how does one get scratched in the face by a turkey when you well first of all i wasn't a, the, i in in the process of this I, what i do with when i did do the turkeys in as it were uh, i put their feet into a little loop and hung them from a, a hook in the shed and in doing so, as I was trying to get the feet into the hole, one of the, the, the feet uh, just sort of ground, glanced across the top of my head, but it, that was not on my face. It was in my hairline, and it wasn't a particularly, um, it was a, a light scratch. If, though, you got the scratches when you say you did mm -hmm. before she was murdered, mm -hmm. why then did nobody in the galley pub that night notice those scratches? Well, because I, 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 I had a long sleeve shirt. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just give you one on this. When he says long sleeve shirt, well, I had a long sleeve shirt. He does disgust at the same time. I, I would suggest that's him smelling his own lie there smelling his own deceit, deceit. <laughs> <laughs> i will just i will leave it at that scott what do you got all right in in 2014 i called greg and i said hey man i just talked to this guy that reminds me of a lizard the whole time i talked to him he looked just like this guy does for about six seconds where he just sitting there looking he's almost freeze framed and when he blinks it's that slow uh shutter speed of a blink and it looked, reminds me, of, this is the most non-blinking guy I've ever seen in my life. Throughout this whole thing, there's not a whole lot of blinking. And theoretically, there should be a whole lot more, and there are some parts. But during this, it, there, there's not a lot of blinking going on. But it reminds me of a lizard, the way lizards look. And that first thing right out of the gate there, where he's sticking his tongue in his mouth, that really weird-looking thing. That's what reminded me of that. Uh, you remember that phone call when I called you, Greg, and said, hey, man, I, I think I just talked to a human lizard. Uh, it's just This is just really uh, abnormal behavior for uh um, a normal human or a normal person. This this is odd all the way around. And he's frozen because he's waiting again to hear that, that question to make sure he gets all the information. Again, he, he jumps the gun a little bit on this guy. So he's, he's, I think this has got him in a, we're seeing his panic being held back, but I think his limbic system's kicked in and we're, we're seeing that start to start to ramp up. I'm not sure exactly when in these series of videos this showed up, but in this one, he doesn't look as panicked as he did a couple back, but it's starting to, I think, I think he's starting to ramp up here. Chase, what do you got? I absolutely agree with you guys. I think there actually is some good blinking here. At the very beginning, his blink rate's up to about a 50, just in anticipation of the question. And when he starts answering the question, it goes down to zero. And there's just eyes are locked right on the interviewer to make sure he's conveying the story. And originally, the scratches on the arms were from the Christmas tree. And now, uh, apparently, they're turkey scratches again. And I think his mouth is open here at the very beginning before he starts to answer. We saw the same thing when we were on Dr. Phil's show, when we were interviewing a uh, massage therapist on there, live on, on the stage there. This mouth open, forcing oxygen and trying to calm himself down. And so we see a lot of indicators of high stress and high th threat recognition before the question is answered. Greg? Yeah, so the first thing I see is distaste. That thing you talk about sucking a lemon a little bit, Mark, in the beginning, and that single shoulder rise right out the gate. Then he goes to Romancer, that staring in your eyes, and he does a lot of that. He's trying to make sure he doesn't make a mistake. Does that mouth grooming thing, and his, breath, his breathing rate is up. 
he does something uncharacteristic, again, another baseline deviation, the same thing we saw in Mark Castellano as he's validating the question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He does it twice. The only time you see in this entire interview. This, by the way, I think is right after the turkey allegation. So this is all tied together. And I see in him then this relief of, thank God, I got a break. And then he goes into, now I'm going to try to tell you this next part. And when he does, I, I'm with you, Chase. His blink rate is through the roof for a split second. Then he does eye lock. His blink rate goes down. Watch his pulse. Watch his watch that tie. His respiration increases. He does that more of that mouth grooming, and then his mouth's actually hanging open a bit. And if you watch it, you'll see all that apprehension starting to build in his face. That brow up, mouth open is apprehension. You see it. And then suddenly he does this thing where this muscle right here, and I think it may be connected to disgust, but that muscle draws down. And when that muscle draws down, that's usually associated with anger. And I think of immediately, if you poked on him, you might get him to come unbuckled right here. If you started poking on his story even more, because that drawdown in that brow is a good indicator that he's feeling a little frustrated at the moment. And the disgust is probably part of that. That's what I got. If though you got the scratches when you say you did mm -hmm. before she was murdered, mm -hmm. why then did nobody in the galley pub that no night notice those scratches? Well, because I, 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 I had a long sleeve shirt. Cool. All right, let's move. If they had evidence, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I, I wouldn't have been released. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know I'm, I'm innocent. I have nothing to do with this killing. Did you kill Levitu? No. I can't tell if they've cut his volume off, the, the volume of the uh, guy asking questions at that point. Can you guys tell when he does that extra nod? I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't. Oh, um, the, I, no, I, I. I presumed it is an extra nod that he's putting in. Yeah, but we don't hear that background noise of it. That's that's the part. You think that it disappears me. completely. Yeah, uh, I think so. I'm, I believe it does. Could just mm. be me. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? So I'm not going to put a lot here. When I say I am innocent, I probably don't string along extra words. That's distancing from the answer in, in interrogation. That's a red flag. And we would say, why did you say, I know I am innocent? Nope, I'm innocent. That's there, all there is. I had nothing to do with it. More words that string you out. He's I locked the entire time. Now, that might just be who he is. He's intense. I read, you know, everything else. Red said he was really an intense person. He does a little nod at no, but I'm not sure that's not an emphatic, and that's all there is. It's not really a head nod like this as much as an emphatic. You guys may see something different. And then he does this whole pushing, you know, kind of washing your hands move in there. So what's going on in his head? Don't know. Just looks like I would poke on him because he's distancing from the answer, and that would be my approach. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, if you're asked that question, you're going to say more than no. It's not going to be no. And you're probably going to go, and most of the time the head shake starts no, starts this before you say no. Because you're as they're asking, you start no, because you're thinking about that question. Just like someone's paying attention when you're asking them a question and they're guilty of something, you focus on that and you're listening to all of it and you start that head shake no when it, before, they fi before they finish asking the question and you answer. In this case, he waits and he says no. Now, that can be an, an, an affirming no. I agree there. And the second one, we were just talking about how the, the volume may be off on that. We can't tell that he said no and then did that again. He may, The guy may have asked him something extra. I can't. We can't really tell on that. But I think we're seeing a pattern here of, of the only emotion we've really seen so far, and I agree with you, Greg, is anger so and and uh, that, that combination of anger and just a little bit of panic in there but here we see no eye no uh, brow movement no eyebrow movement nothing like that and there always seems the one thing in this this delivery of uh it's not monotone but it's just odd it just sounds odd um and we're not seeing emotion where we should be seeing emotion. And that's what that's another thing that sets off red flags for me. And that's where you start digging in, trying to get that emotion out of them and see what's in there. Or if you can flip them on that, because when they're doing that, they've got a wall up and it's, you've got a while to get through there and, and to get to, to to be able to touch them real good and, and get them working around without the without that wall up. In other words, to get to break the wall down and break through that. Um, now I think we're looking at at this point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it because I've seen all the videos. But we're looking at a malignant narcissist here, and that's malignant 
is 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 different than like a regular old narcissist. You know, you have different different levels of them. This is what I call a clinical narcissist. You have the malignant narcissist, which is right up next to to scooch on in there to psychopathy, because they can be dangerous. They can be uh, really volatile, and they're this is. But I think that, I don't think this guy's a psychopath. But I, I I'm I'd put all my chips on malignant narcissist at this point. Chase, what do you got? I agree with everybody here. And I think that, Greg, your comment about I know I'm innocent is a very different comment than I am innocent. Those are two very different things. Uh, I can know something and it not be true. And I can feel like I know something and it not be true. So the one thing that, that guilty people start doing the moment after the crime is committed they start internally justifying, rationalizing, and minimizing what they just did. And that process doesn't stop. So it gets easier and easier to think back to the day that it happened as time passes by. It's a continuous reprocessing that crime as a justified thing. And, and we're gonna hear we're gonna talk about justification in just a few seconds. But I think we see again, this is a perfect opportunity to see the rapid mouth closure that we saw in the first video that he did it in the denial long ago. I, I think this is some almost 20 years ago, this this uh, video that we're looking at here. So it's a great clip, uh, great choice, Greg. Uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, so I, I I agree. He's doing justification and he's worked out some faulty, skewed logic around this. Two pieces of logic. One is, if they had evidence, I would not be released. That's, that's not logically accurate. There could be all kinds of reasons why there would be evidence and you'd still get released. So that logic is faulty. Um, also, he's, he's, he suggests he's innocent because I know I'm innocent. You've really covered this, Chase, but exactly. It's, it's not logical that just because you know you're innocent that you are innocent. Uh, and I only want to bring that up again because we're going to see this faulty logic extended even further um, throughout these clips that we've got. Um, yeah, the, he's got the very emphatic no, hasn't he? And then, yes, he does then back that up with another emphatic nod. Uh, I see what you're saying there, uh, Scott, that there's, the, a question may have been asked looking at it. I'm not sure whether we see any recognition of somebody else talking at that point. There seems to be a sense of nothing happening and the interviewer just letting it to see whether he'll he'll you know build on the no and i think you know i i would stake some money on that that's another emphatic no uh which comes across as incongruous in this because it's not needed it was emphatic enough at the start the no was okay you know it's a straight no you don't really need anything else on top of that so that kind of alarms me slightly and this is the point where we get in the younger him this more pronounced irish accent especially in that no it's a way more irish vowel on the no so we've got somebody who is uh, northern english here uh born there we've got this older version of him which has quite a a let's just say middle class standard received pronunciation english with some uh northern vowels when under stress and here in the earlier version of him we got a more irish accented version so we've got somebody who's quite happy to change their accent as to the situation now we know all of us kind of do that now and again for all kinds of of social situations but this is under stress and pressure uh you know there, there might be a sense of we've got somebody who's performing a role you know which one is him who's he trying to perform what's he trying to perform for what is the result he's trying to get from these different accents i don't quite know the answers to that but it's notable and it's interesting that that's what he seems to be doing from my point of view there that's all i got on that one all right uh let me add something to this and greg you may want to add to it as well this week in the comments we got a whole lot of people saying you're teaching people how to lie you're telling them what to look out for and stuff no we're not well, there's a lot of stuff we're not saying just so you know we're not telling you everything we know on here there are a lot of things you don't that we would never say um 
Chase just sounds like he's getting all technical up in there, but I promise you he's not telling you anything that we shouldn't be telling. So as we go the last this, thing to tell you is, okay, if we do tell you, wait until you meet one of us because it's going to be your worst nightmare that you know what we're looking for and you can't hide it because we know a lot of dirty tricks that, I mean, some of the things that I've used in my career, you really don't want to run into. So I would say, if you're accused of something, get a lawyer. And if you're innocent, especially if you're innocent, get a lawyer. Because yeah. this is not what you think it is. The, we're, we're not teaching people to get away from the police. Trust us. Yeah. They know a lot oh, yeah. Of, a lot That's the last thing we want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. cuz what well we yeah cuz why would you give somebody information that you know you're going to go in and talk to and they're going to know what you know. Yeah, when you're you in know? front of the police the first thing you're going to do is forget everything we've said. Cat <laughs> brain engage. <right? laughs> yeah. So that's why you want a lawyer. Like the the, the uh, crime scene shows teach you how to become a murderer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we're teaching you facts about how to use body language, what we see and how we would approach it. But we're also going to tell, and Mark, you hit it dead on. Wait, the first time somebody is arrested, and you know, I, I was an interrogator when I went through SEER school. Didn't help me because my little brain was going, uh, 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 uh. And then you learn, and the whole school it gave me the opportunity to bring my thinking brain back online. But guys, I'm telling you, when the first time you meet an interrogator and you've committed a crime, it, it, the, the problem is the crime itself. Chase started by telling you this. The crime itself does a lot of the work for us because humans don't, most of us don't go around killing each other. And most people, when they do it, it's going to be a, an anomaly in their life and it's going to consume them to the point they're not going to be able to hide the information. Go watch everybody we're covering. Some of these are brilliant people, I'm sure. They just don't look brilliant once they get in front of this. If they had evidence, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I, I wouldn't have been released. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know I'm, I'm innocent. I have nothing to do with this killing. Did you kill the tree? No. Yeah. So many people all coming forward and all saying Ian Bailey one way or another said, surely it's beyond coincidence. Surely there's something there. Well, um, uh, one, I, they weren't admissions. I was using irony as a tactic, albeit I can see now very unwisely. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'll go first on this one. Nobody says, ironically, I killed somebody. Nobody does that. Nobody does. It's never happened before. It's never going to happen. It OJ. doesn't happen. What? OJ. Do it. He said it. He said he said it ironically. Wrote a book about it. Oh. <laughs> I don't think he thought it was ironic, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Except for OJ. Because he's, he didn't do it. So, uh, anyway, so that's, that's what, that's, that's what I got. All right. Uh, cause I don't know. I, I just can't get past that, that part. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So maybe irony doesn't mean what he thinks it means. Maybe he was talking about sarcasm or, or something else. Uh, but look, here's what he does by doing that. He, he elevates himself by going, look at my linguistic skill and, and linguistic skill is, is an elevation. I mean, you know, people with linguistic skill get paid more. Uh, it's a, the people with linguistic skill can be quite attractive to, to people who they want to attract. And so that so he elevates himself. Look, I used irony. It's kind of ironic that it probably wasn't irony. It was more likely sarcasm. But there we go. That's that's tautological, isn't it? There. How how erudite was that? And so then what he does because he's so erudite and so high is he lowers himself by going with some modesty, going that was probably you know not a very good thing. Uh, to do. So he's not only having power over how high he is, but he's then taking power over how low he goes. He's completely controlling his status here to the point, and that's to the point that many have made here within narcissism, uh, regardless of it might be malignant or some other, uh, status is, is clearly massively important. And the more you can control your status and control the status of others, uh, the, the better off you are as a narcissist. So interesting there. Now we get um, we get 
this lean in, we get this listening carefully, then we get uh, confusion and then innocence. There's, there's a number of emotions that run through and they all happen too quickly. Uh, it's like, it's like, um, really bad. So I help a lot of animators with, with, um, not necessarily the body language to use, but, but what is natural for how long an emotion lasts and, 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 and what would be a pattern or succession of emotions. And in bad animation, mainly stuff happens too short, too many things happen for too short amount of time. And you get these kind of animated things that kind of wobble around and do, do lots of kind of, stuff and the animator feels like they've really captured the essence of a human being being real but actually it just looks like nonsense and weird because we as, as human beings are trying to conserve energy all the time so we're trying to do the very least to get away with being alive he's doing the very most possible in order to get away with being alive which means for me i'm thinking he's trying to get away with something he's trying to get away with something on purpose he's acting he's performing a role here badly because he did too many things too fast it's too confusing uh it's too energetic human beings aren't like that they conserve they do the very minimal just to get away with it uh there that's what i got for you and uh greg what do you got so we're on the same page. I will say, let's first start. Maybe he was listening to Alanis Morissette to define his irony. So we'll start there. <laughs> but then the next part is from the side. If you will look at him, you'll see his chin is down and his respiration's pretty high when this thing first starts. But this is a tripwire for this guy. He's prepared for this question and watch him. No other place do I see amusement in his face than this one. This is a chance to talk about how smart he is and to go down that path. His blink rate begins to to pick up, but then he goes to eye lock, his eyes open, and he's showing genuine interest. Remember, I always talk about energy, direction, and focus. His energy is high, his direction is external, and his focus is sharp, which means he's interested. You see him paying really close attention. He's hanging on his every word until, until... He gives him the chance to answer the question. And when he gives him the chance to answer the question, then he goes down this whole path about, well, here's what I'm after. Here's, here's what happened. It was irony. He's trying to show you again how, Mark, to your whole point about language and education and all of that. And I think the amusement comes from, look, I'm smarter than you thought I was. And it's self-amusement. You can see that little light in his eyes and that kind of light up face. And then I, if I've ever seen anything that I automatically thought might be duper's delight, that might be it right there. And this guy is arrogant, and I see that jump off there. When he's doing it, look at that forehead. Look at that billboard. When people ask me, what's the difference in a quick brow rise and request for approval? I'm telling you something and holding my forehead up, that's request for approval. I'm waiting for you to give me the answer. He's, I, I can hear it in his, in his mind. These people, he said this to somebody else in a different interview. Um, maybe they weren't just weren't accustomed to dealing a man like me with a certain amount of education. That sure bleeds out all over him here. So then what you do is you realize he's falling for his own press. He's starting to believe that he's this or that or this or that. And we know that narcissism comes from self-loathing, but you aggrandize to cover up all that. So you'd have to go after him and take that down. I'll leave mine at that. And Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just really quickly paraphrase what, what this thing really says. He says, yeah, when I told all those people that I killed her and I was the one that committed the crime and I used those words as tactics, that was probably a bad idea. <laughs> that's, a, that's a summary of, of what was just said. And uh, if you've ever watched a cartoon, got a pull from Mark a little bit, uh, every villain in every cartoon has one thing in common, that the lighting is shown from one side of the face only. They always, even in even in non-cartoons, have lighting from the side, lighting from the top, lighting from the bottom. And I think it's interesting that there was some choice was made to light him from only one side, where he almost looks two-faced in in this video here. And uh, Greg, I'm trying to think of something where I can pull Alanis Morissette in here, but I, I can't. <laughs> but I will say when you're talking about Greg and how he's locked in to, to identify what is this a threat? Am I being threatened or not? If you dressed up in like a gorilla costume and snuck into your own house, think about that look your dog's going to give you while it's trying to 
trying to size you up. It's exactly the same look as when you're pulling open a bag of Cheetos. It's just a really sharp focus to analyze exactly what's going on and assess the situation. Threat and value. Those two things, very important to all of us animals. And I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Okay. Mark, I got a feeling you're going to be the other end of the little jiggly dance. Yeah, yeah. I like <laughs> the Cheetos reference. <laughs> I hope you really like it. So many people all coming forward and all saying Ian Bailey one way or another said, surely it's beyond coincidence. Surely there's something there. Well, um, uh, one, I, they weren't admissions. I was using irony as a tactic, albeit I can see now very unwisely. <laughs> I do really like it. Violence, you can't really contest that, can you? Um, no, but it has to be taken in context. Is there a context for domestic violence? Well, there, there was in my case because I, I, I was irresponsible with alcohol. I was irresponsible with whiskey. Just kidding. Hi, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to beat this one to death, not to steal the wrong words. But what I would say is I would take this guy to a pub and let's see if his logic, here's some more of that particular kind of logic. Does his logic hold up when a bunch of pub boys start beating the hell out of him? Because that's abuse of alcohol and so they beat him. That's a good, ex reasonable excuse. This is a way to say, look, and it's trading guilt. You always hear me saying trading guilt. Well, yeah, I was a drunk. I, I, beating her was an accident because I was drunk. There's no excuse, no excuse for that. You can see that he actually knows that it is not excusable because he actually does a little bit of drawing of his mouth when he first starts. When he touches his nose, I know everybody's gonna jump to, he's lying because he touches his nose. This is a convenient barrier. It's a way to hide behind his hand is all it is. And you know, when people touch their nose, it can be because of blood flow and that this is a way to hide behind something because he's just that guy. Anybody who will find an excuse for why they beat their wife and say it was inexcusable. He, he made me think of Prince Andrew when Prince Andrew said an ordinary shooting weekend. He was looking for a reason why he didn't do anything wrong. And you can see the disgust in the internal conversation. And that's what I'm going to leave it at. Take him to a pub and let's see how his logic holds up. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. An, an ordinary alcoholic beating, just your average one. Nothing, nothing to look at here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So that nose piece, great barrier. And when you put that together in a cluster, look on its own, could be anything. I rub my nose a lot because it's like there's pollen in the air around here. I don't come from Canada. There's stuff in the air here that I wasn't born around. My, you know sends me crazy. Um, so, so rubbing my nose is actually part of my baseline here in Canada. Um, but for him, it doesn't seem part of his baseline. We haven't seen it elsewhere. We're not seeing the whole of his life here. It's just a video, uh, some video clips, but we haven't seen it before anywhere else. And if we put that together with the blink rate that happens there, the disgust that we see as well, uh, there's what I think is some internal dialogue as well. He's thinking about what he's talking about while he says it. That's quite a cluster for me of something is going on here that he doesn't even quite buy himself. He's making this up and he doesn't even particularly like what he's making up here. Uh, Chase, what do you got for us? I agree with every one of you guys but on, on the nose. And speaking of the nose, this uh, facial touching and mouth covering, scientifically speaking or research speaking, have been the number one nonverbal behaviors based on research uh, linked to nonverbal signs of deception. And that's when you get a college kid to sit in front of some guy with a clipboard and lie to him. This, when the stakes are low, behaviors are very different. High stakes mean different behaviors. Low stakes means like you're not going to get a lollipop, you're not going to get a dollar bill. It's, it's very hard to measure deception in a laboratory. I'll just say that. But there is some merit to if someone's touching their face and covering their mouth at the same time, there's a, there's a natural reaction in humans to kind of cover our mouth when something happens. The same thing, we don't ever teach kids to cover their mouth, but if you see a kid accidentally drop the F-bomb in front of their parents for the first time, you're going to see that kind of behavior. You're going to see that instinctive reaching up for the mouth. So just a good, a good data point there. And this, we see some glabella 
uh, flexing there, which is typically associated with dislike. And one thing that happens over time, I think these people start to soften what happened. And we see that he has a habit of softening. He didn't, he didn't abuse alcohol. He didn't get drunk all the time. He didn't drink too much. He was just irresponsible with alcohol. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal because it was just a smaller, less offensive word. So we see some what's called severity softening here. So we see a, a lot of uh, red flag data points here. That's all I got. All right. Is that everybody? No, I'll go. So uh, after, that, after that question, he looks down like a child would look down when they're in trouble because he knows this isn't good for him. And that I, the thing with the Globella there, Chase, I think that's I, some people say it's a micro expression. It's not a micro expression. This happens very quickly. And it looks to me like, in my opinion, I would say that's anger we're looking at because that's the that's the except for the, the eyes don't. You don't see the whites of the eyes when, when you're doing that. It's almost like he's been punched and he's and he goes back in anger and comes as the question's hitting him. He comes back um, with that with that face. Um, the broken speech pattern. That's like when he got busted before. So he's starting that all over again. And this is so far. This is the only time he's re re accepted responsibility for anything. He does it twice. But this is this is the first time we're seeing it. And it's really not a, a, taking the responsibility for it. He's just that's just the coward's way out. So what this guy's doing because he's a coward. Anybody that does what this guy's and because he, he admits beating his wife. So he's a coward. And he's we all we all have other uh, adjectives we'd like to use and descriptive terms we'd like to use for that guy. But that's what we'll leave it at that is is coward at this point. And it's the rear. It's the only time he accepts responsibility, doesn't accept responsibility, but he agrees that he's made a mistake there. And that's tough for a, a narcissist, especially a malignant narcissist. And like Greg was saying, the basis of that is they loathe themselves. They, they, they know what they are. They hate themselves. So this is, this is, this, this whole thing just rings of malignant narcissist to me. All right. Is that everybody? Yep. Violence. You can't really contest that, can you? Uh, no, but it has to be taken in context. Uh, is there a context for domestic violence? Well, yeah, there, there was in my case because I'd, I, I, I was irresponsible with alcohol. I was irresponsible w with whiskey. It's a move. The libel trial went into very, very personal details from your diaries. You wrote in some detail about being sexually very aggressive. You said that you were a monster or a beast or something um, like that. I, I do know. I, I can't remember. I may, I may have made a reference to my behavior towards Jules. That I behaved very badly. Um, but the, that doesn't make me a killer. Chase, what do you got? Killing somebody makes you a killer. So I could list off hundreds of things that don't make me a killer until I say killing somebody makes you a killer. We see his breathing rate back up to about 50 here. Remember 20 or below 18 or below is about the average. We see chest and chest versus abdomen breathing up into his chest you know, at that breathing rate. There's a rapid increase in blink rate right before the question is answered. And then as he starts to answer, it is target focus. It is threat identification and threat focus. I think it's interesting that he, in all of his videos and any other uh, media, he's using his right hand most of the time to gesture. He uses his left hand to talk about jewels and he uses this blocking gesture where he's, he's cutting it off, pushing it away and, and blocking. The, there is authentic eye accessing here. We, we're seeing him access real information when the journal's coming up. He's, he's really trying to think what was actually there. What can I grab out of that page that, was, that can, you know, knock one domino down that might knock some rest of the story uh, down as well. So there's some great baseline here in this video. When he says, uh, I behaved very badly and... This is another example of severity softening. I behaved badly. I was irresponsible with alcohol. So now we're seeing a pattern of softening the severity of his own behavior. Greg? So he's trading guilt again. <clears throat> he's trying to find a reason. He says, I was very bad to, to Jules. That's another trading guilt. So just because he says, I di didn't do this 
doesn't make it true. To your point, Chase, if you listen, now I'm going to back up after I say this. The last thing he says is he says, it doesn't make me a killer. That's a pause. There's a negative. I mean, there's, that's negative in the way he speaks because everything else he's done is like this. His cadence is flowing or he might get into that glitchy all over the place thing. It's the first time he's done a pause just before he says a killer. Interesting, because if I were accused of a criminal thing, I wouldn't want to put that pause ahead of it and draw attention to that word. <clears throat> Watch his shoulders. They're moving constantly when he's talking. His eye accessing cues, you're dead on chase. He does two eye accessing cues. More importantly, when he says in your journal, he gets concerned in his forehead. Once you make an accusation, then I would be like, OK, I'm confused. But he hasn't made any accusation. So the timing of that crazy little face thing is before he said anything. And then he goes away from where he normally goes. He goes to his right and starts rifling through. Uh oh, what did I say in my journal that's going to be a problem? And then he once he brings up what he said, then he goes back to his left and he looks at the ledger and figures out what's there. So you're seeing two different behaviors. One that is if you're if you're trying to find a person's baseline, this guy's going over here all the time and suddenly he goes over here. There's something different going on in his head. Now, can we say exactly what? No, but we can say something is varying there. And so we want to know why. Then he, when he's breaking that eye contact, it's because he's actually thinking. People do. People can break eye contact for a number of reasons. The thousand yard stare a lot of military guys get. That's not the same thing. But this guy's rifling through his head and you can't miss it. When he comes back to his left and then he starts to illustrate and he uses his hands. And he uses the one thing we always say is the easiest to fight. I can't remember. I can't remember. So I, the pressure's up on this guy. Things are negative now. This is not about the turkey scratching his head. This is about, did you beat your wife? Were you sexually aggressive? These are character assassinating things that do start to say, hmm, you had a problem with alcohol. You beat your wife. You're sexually aggressive. You were still drinking when this was going on. We don't know where you were. Now he's starting to feel pressure and you can see it. Look at his respiration. Watch that tie. As his heart's pounding, it's pretty easy to see. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I totally agree. He's going right down the road of telling on himself. In other words, he says all these things that happened. Yes, I, I may have, I, my behavior was bad towards Jules, and and I abused whiskey and all that. But it doesn't make me a monster. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You just contradicted yourself. If you if you hit women, and you're some guy who's all drunk hitting women, yeah, you're a monster. That's what they're made of. That's how you make one. That's how you become one. Children know you as that. Wives know you as that. That's what you are. So yeah, he is that. Why would he say monster? You know, why would he why do you say it doesn't make me a monster? Yeah, it does. You are one. You just said you were. That was I'm getting a little too into this. Anyway, so I think we're seeing a pattern of behavior that he's talking about that shows he's a candidate. What makes him a candidate to be the person who who may have committed a crime this bad. How's that for a wording? So uh that's what I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nothing much else other than some reiterations of what you're saying there. Yeah, for me, breathing rate suddenly goes really high. Blink rate is there as well. Love to see those eye accessing cues as he goes for, you know, what's in that? What have they got on me? Uh, what did I write in that journal? But none of the eye ac accessing that I see is about self-reflection. So he's utter in that moment of going, hey, what kind of character do you think you are? He he has to access stuff that he's written down. He has to access data. He doesn't go inward and go, let me just think about myself for a moment and now inform you who I am right now. This is the kind of values that I work under. Let me explain myself right now. Doesn't have the capacity, could be stress, could be pressure, to be reflective in this situation. Maybe he's not somebody who's that reflective a lot of the time. And again, that might fit quite well into the persona type of the narcissist, maybe even different types of, na of narcissists. Somebody who, well, if they're really reflective, if they really think about themselves, uh, that's, uh, you know, emotionally, uh, pretty hard for them to do. It's 
painful for them because as Scott said, because of the loathing, it's painful to think about yourself. So you externalize that, you build up a big ego, you build up a big story about yourself. Uh, you use those stories to lower other people's status as well. So that by default, you're grander and you get this grandiose figure who's unable to really touch upon their selves. Now, you know, that might be a big extrapolation from from this little piece here, but it no, maybe maybe it's not. Maybe it's pretty accurate. But anyway, you decide. What do you think? There. Yeah, guys, not once has anybody said this guy committed murder. Not one of us. What we're saying mm -hmm. is <clears throat> if you are if I were interrogating a guy and I see a pattern of beat your wife three times, one bad enough to be hospitalized, and have stuff done to her, have repairs made, admitted it. Say you have a problem with alcohol. This is around the time you were having troubles with alcohol and you had some sexual thing that you wrote out in your diary. Now, if I'm in the interrogation room, I got things to play with. And that's what you're seeing this interviewer do is say, bink, bink, I'm putting you in a box with bad guys. Now you tell me why you're not a bad guy. And people leak information when they get to tell you why they're not a bad guy. Yeah. The libel trial went into very, very personal details from your diaries. You wrote in some detail about being sexually very aggressive. You said that you were a monster or a beast or something um, like that. I, I do know. I, I can't remember. I, might, I may have made a reference to my behavior towards Jules, that I behaved very badly. Um, but the, that doesn't make me a killer. The French investigation team had a psychiatrist read uh, these extracts from the diary and offer an opinion on your character. Um, he mentions, I'm quoting directly now, narcissism, psycho rigidity, violence, impulsiveness, egocentricity, intolerance of frustration and a great need for recognition. Do you recognize yourself in any of that? No, no, no I don't. There were a number of m mistakes, maybe, that I made a moment. You have no alibi. Well, I, um, do I, I need an alibi? Uh, I, I mean, I know that I have nothing to do with this. Now, it's very difficult to prove a negative, and all, this has been one of my problems over the years. Because I was so, I, I've been accused, all of the effort was put on to making me the murderer. I, it's very difficult to, to prove a negative. And I, I, I've not been able to sufficiently so far um, do that. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, after he says nice narcissism, after the guy goes down the list of narcissism, then um, psycho rigidity, he's talking about mental rigidity. And so and that's where you, the person refuses to see things from another person's point to accept that. And that's when he has a problem. As soon as he says that, you see him recoil from that as he's refusing to accept any of that. So he's this is what he's describing. He's showing us the definition of that as he goes through it. Um, and the same thing for the narcissist part, the narcissism part. He's just this this is this guy's just pointing out all of his problems. He doesn't agree to one of them. He says, none of that looks like me. And all we've talked about is how he's a narcissist and how he's all these things. He's refusing to accept any of that. And the, and the guy, the psychologist, just just said this from reading his diary, from reading his journal. So that's pretty hardcore there if you can figure that stuff out. And you can see him recoiling from these things as the guy's explaining him. I'm, I'm, I really got to watch what I'm saying on here. So I'm going to make mine short. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think what's happening there is irony. <laughs> Just, just so, if, if, okay. Ian Bailey, if you're watching, so that, so that was, that's what we call irony. Okay, so, so, I you're mean, not on his Christmas really, list anymore. Right, right, exactly. I won't be getting a, a Christmas card from Ian Bailey, and I'm sure the poetry would have been fantastic. Yeah, um, and and the thoughts beautiful. Anyway, um, look. Um, Mr. Bailey is is not as smart as he thinks because uh, he, he makes a fundamental um, uh, mistake with the idea of logic. This idea of you cannot um, prove a negative. Absolutely, 
Uh, absolutely, you can. Here, let me do it. Okay. Uh, I, I assert that unicorns do not exist. Okay. Let me prove that ne negative. There are. There is no record of unicorns in fossils. No record at all. Okay. So therefore, now you could go back. Hey, Mark, are fossils really real? And are they? Well, no. You see, you don't have to. But if you have to trace back your logic to every assertion, you can't prove anything. So in in the world of logic absolutely you can prove negatives now what he says is so it's a classic mistake ian bailey makes a classic mistake of logic by going you can't prove uh, a negative now you you can assert it is not my my position to uh, uh, to uh, prove a negative that is not my the preponderance of evidence is is not upon me it is not my burden that's a whole different thing okay he says i've i've not um i've not been able to sufficiently do so so far not been able to he's not been able to disprove so it's a double negative. He creates his own positive assertion that logically he did it by, by doing a double negative. So I'm not, listen, I'm not saying Ian Bailey did anything, but in this, logically, Ian Bailey is saying that he did it because he does a double negative around this murder. That uh, is actually what they call logic now. Uh, that's not how courts work. So just so you know, courts don't tend to use that kind of, of logic. But there, that's that's my little uh, little piece for you uh, there. Or maybe maybe I was just being sarcastic with all of that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Chase, what do you got? We've gone from unicorns to <laughs> cartoons to Alanis Morissette in the course of 15 minutes. I like it. And let's, I think his, his drive to feel significant is stronger than his internal narcissism. I think he has an unusual case of, of narcissistic behavior here. I won't say narcissism. I'm not a clinician. Uh, I'm not making a diagnosis. Uh, but in narcissism, I want you to just to view narcissism as an empty file labeled personality and identity. And a narcissist can't fill that file themselves. Other people have to put data into that file. So that's where the narcissist will go and collect personality data from other people. And I think a, a classic narcissist, where Scott's referring to malignant narcissists, which I uh, agree with, but non-diagnostically, I'll just say that for legal purposes, uh, a classic narcissist would probably have left the city a long time ago because the data getting fed into the personality and identity folder is going to be negative. They will start to believe it before too long. So I think when he's saying I made a number of mistakes, maybe we see more severity softening. And there's an even an uh, appeal for approval there. There's some eyebrow flash to the interviewer here. And he says, I know that I have nothing to do with this. Have present tense, nothing to do with this. And that's probably correct, present tense. Maybe that's correct to him in the present tense. And we've already, we've already beat that to death and what, what people say, uh, I know that I'm innocent. I know that I didn't do this. I know that I have nothing to do with this. All very similar. I'll just leave it at that. Greg? Yeah. So I love the irony here. Mark, to your whole point, the thing he gets most disappointed about, and he might not even know what it means, is the psycho rigidity, I think is what they called it. I call it rigid, rigid behavior. And when he does that, he immediately pushes back. Scott and I were laughing about, ha, ha, ha. yeah, no, I'm not rigid. I love that behavior. Yeah. There's some irony there. So great one. <clears throat> some of the best fight or flight you're ever going to see in your life is right here. And it's sustained. It's been here long enough that around his eyes are getting dry and his eyes are starting to sag more. His mouth needs wetting. So all that mucous membranes are drying out and you're seeing the be the benefit of fight or flight. Does that mean he killed anybody? No. It means that he is stressed around this point. Then he actually has shock, just a minor version of shock when they bring up the psychiatrist. Like, that's admissible. They're going to talk about my health records or whatever he perceives it to be. And then when they go into the rigidity thing, he gets really upset. If you watch, he also does 
one of my favorites, not the chained elephant, but the rock. He's got a rock rate, not a sway rate. It's starting. Stress has got him. That's a self-comforting thing. And then he says one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Do I need an alibi? Well, apparently in France, it would have been nice to have. When you're accused of murder, an alibi is a key element of how you get out of that. Not having one is kind of dumb. And then he goes into this next big thing. And Mark, I think what we're seeing when he starts down the negative, no way to prove a negative. I think Robert Barnes would disagree, probably a whole bunch of attorneys who make a lot of money proving the ne disproving the negative work wonders. But he goes into chaff and redirect, and that's all it is. It's poor me, poor me, self-pity, chaff, redirect, chaff, redirect. Does that mean he killed her? No. But it does mean his logic is broken, and I think he's starting, even he can see a little bit in the mirror right here that things are starting to pile up on him. Now, does that mean he killed her? Again, no. But it surely has a lot of stupid things there. Alibi, fight or flight, biggest pushback is around rigidity. It just finds this, this one's the most amusing one we've done in a while. That's what I got. <laughs> The French investigation team had a psychiatrist read uh, these extracts from the diary and offer an opinion on your character. Um, he mentions, I'm quoting directly now, narcissism, psycho rigidity, violence, impulsiveness, egocentricity, intolerance of frustration and a great need for recognition. Do you recognize yourself in any of that? No, no, no I don't. There were a number of m mistakes, maybe, that I made a moment. You have no alibi. Well, I, um, do I, I need an alibi? Uh, I, I mean, I know that I have nothing to do with this. Now, it's very difficult to prove a negative, and all, this has been one of my problems over the years. Because I was so, I, I've been accused, all of the effort was put on to making me the murderer. I, it's very difficult to, to prove a negative. And I, I, I've not been able to sufficiently so far um, do that. Great. I gave a sample of hair. I had hair pulled from my, as did my partner, and we gave it um, on the basis that in, in Sophie's hand had been found hair. My view was this, you know, take my DNA, test it against the DNA you found, and you will find it isn't mine. Would you be happy to submit your DNA now again in 2017? Uh, I, well, one, I'm, I don't have to. I'm not being asked to. But in principle, I wouldn't have an objection. <laughs> There's our boy. <laughs> wow. How did I get my foot out of this trap? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Hey, Chase, what were you going to say about the bingo card? Yeah, Greg just did a couple of chaff and redirects. So if you downloaded the behavioral panel bingo card from our community board and you are playing bingo let us know and send us a picture of it at hashtag the behavior panel anywhere on social media we'd love to see it and it's it definitely makes our day when we see that stuff yeah all right greg you want to go first sure i'm not going to cover the entire thing let's start with him as a young person eyes riveted way too much eye contact but i think that may be part of his persona he was larger than life in town. They said he would demand people listen to poetry in the pub and that kind of thing. And I said to Scott, can you imagine going into a South Georgia bar and saying, all you guys need to listen to me? Yeah, that wouldn't go over so well. And these guys were tolerant. And they said he was larger than life. So maybe that's part of his persona. But he's it's dramatic. It's almost like he's trying to deliver a dramatic line. I, again, probably back to his persona. His eyes are locked. He goes, we gave hair and well, we didn't volunteer. This is, they probably came around and said, hey, we'd like some DNA from anybody that we think is involved. That's it for there. But then when he gets into where he's talking about, it's my view and that kind of thing, it's my view that if, if my DNA didn't match, I'd be okay. He's illustrating with his hand and doing kind of a timeline. Looks reasonable, looks right. Then just as he gets to the end there, there's apprehension. And we can see apprehension because your, your brow is up, your eyes are locked, and your mouth is open. How many times I've in my life interrogated prisoners real and seer that apprehension is the number one thing you see on their face that and you can see it starting to creep into him as he says uh where he basically says it wouldn't be mine i forget his exact words right there at the end that's desmond morris 101 desmond morris said that anything distasteful you push out of your mouth so while he may be saying the words he does a tongue jot there at the end does it mean he killed anybody no but it means you saw him as a young man saying one thing. Now you see him as an old man saying one thing. And they're very different body languages. 
just would say that. And I think part of it's because he had an, an impression he was trying to deliver in the first one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing. He says, in principle, I would not have an objection. In principle, there's no objection to re-delivering the DNA. It doesn't talk anything about what would happen in reality. So principles are different from if you actually, if the actual cop turned up and said, give me the hair sample, give me the swab from the mouth. Um, so, you know, using a, a, a sleight of mouth there in terms of using principles instead of absolutely in reality, bring it on, got no problem at all. So clearly he does have a problem. He does have an issue with in reality delivering fresh DNA samples or, or uh, you know, a DNA test under the modern, more modern criteria being done at this point. Scott, what do you got for us? I totally agree. I think he got away with the DNA test last time because he that apparently he didn't give very much hair. I'm, but I'm sure they asked for it. But back then, I, I don't think DNA was as as uh, potent as it is as it is now. But then he says he would give it, uh, but shaking his head no as he's saying, yeah, he would give him he would give him some DNA, but he hasn't been asked. So why would he even bring that up? Th that's on his mind. He's worried about that. He's worried about that. Because there's no other reason to say, well, they haven't asked me what I would give it. Yeah. You would say, yeah, man, you want it? Come and get it. That's all. What, that's what we would say. You want DNA? Here. I'm gonna, why don't I spit in this cup or whatever you need me to do? There you go. Here's my DNA, man. Go, you know, go knock yourself out with it. But he's not going to do that. If it came up, I'll bet he'd fight it because I did it before. Why well, do you need it again? You know, I'm not doing it again. I've already done that. That would be his argument. Um, and we're seeing the old behavior compared with the new behavior is fascinating because we're not seeing any emotions at all in that in that in the old behavior like we like like we saw before in the old behavior. Nothing's there. But in these in this behavior, we're seeing. We're seeing a whole lot comparatively with that. So whether he's he's aged and become more mature with his his um, emotions and be able to share his emotions <laughs> with people, or whatever the situation is, he's uh, he's a lot more animated now than he used to be. So I think his confidence is low on this, and we see that by all those little the shoulder jerks and and his approach to it and how he's kind of. His head's cocked for a little bit, and, he's, and, and his delivery with that, I think he's unsure of this, and I think he's worried about it. And I want to say, I want to put 100 bucks on it if anybody wants to take the bet. He's not going to give up his DNA easily if he gives it up, because his, his argument will be, I already gave it before, and that'll be his, that'll be his argument. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I'm definitely not going to take that bet. <laughs> but, uh, he begins head shaking and then goes to head turning. As soon as he realized what the question is, I think that's a great little clip right there. There's a head shaking, and a second later, there's head turning uh, right as he realizes what the question is about. And he starts with this thing that he's kind of famous for from what I've seen. Every time he's asked a question, he starts with these numbered lists. He goes, well, number one, and then never. there's no other – usually no other numbers coming after that and he is starved for oxygen in this clip and you can see his body is starved for oxygen you can see his mouth open pulling in as much air as he can uh there's a denial first followed by in principle well i'm going to do it in principle and i think it's interesting to note that he was in the first clip that you watched tonight with us he welcomed a new trial uh, and, and now he's not very comfortable with it, and he's a little bit hesitant with the new technology. That's all I got here. Yeah. Yep. I gave a sample of hair. I had hair pulled from my, as did my partner, and we gave it um, on the basis that in, in Sophie's hand had been found hair. My view was this. You know, take my DNA, test it against the DNA you found, and you will find it isn't mine. Would you be happy to submit your DNA now again in 2017? Uh, I, I, well, at one, I'm, I don't have to. I'm not being asked to, but in principle, I wouldn't have an objection. Yep, that's it. On one occasion, while she was in residence in the cottage, I saw a person inside the house at some considerable distance. I wouldn't have been able to recognize them, known who they were. So did you ever meet her? No, I didn't ever meet her. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, really simple, easy one on here. Did you ever meet her? 
no is a fine answer. Just go with no. That's it. You know, and, and again, I'm not trying to teach you how to lie here because if you get in this situation and you did meet somebody and, you know, I ask you, did you ever meet that person? You'll forget that I said, just say no. No will be fine. Don't qualify it in any way. Don't repeat anything. No is a really good answer. Fall silent. Wait for the next question. You'll forget. You'll forget because the pressure will be too high. And you'll, if you have met that person, you'll come up with a whole bunch of stuff around it. Okay. He says no. I didn't ever meet her. It's unnecessary to say the the rest. That's a red flag for me. On top of everything else. That's all I want to say on that one. Scott, what do you got? I think you pretty much covered all that for me. I mean, when he says, he says, no, that's all you got to say. You know, I agree with all that. I got, I got, I'm not, I can't add anything else to that. I don't know what else can add. I know Greg's dying. You got something over there, Greg. What do you got? I have a couple of things. So number one, the biggest illustrator we've seen is I saw her from a distance. He's distancing himself on a grand scale like nothing else he's done in this entire thing. Not a big deal, except it's different in different matters. It's what we call baseline, right? If I suddenly do something dramatic, then it means something. Could it just be emphatic? Sure, but he's not saying anything emphatic at that point. The other thing is he's got a request for approval, that forehead's up, and his chin is down. We usually think when somebody's chin drops, they're protecting their throat. When they're protecting their throat, it's out of shame, guilt, or negative emotions. We also think that when you're asking for approval and your head's up, just go back, watch the last, freeze the, the video when he pauses at that last second. There's so much going on there that you can't miss that something's changed him. His body even looks smaller. So here, I would say, hmm, I would poke on this a little bit more and say, when you say from a distance, you saw her inside the house, how'd you see her? What does she look like? You know, where was she at in the house? I would ask all kinds of questions here because I think then you're going to get him to kind of come unbuckled a little bit. Even because people incriminate whether he killed her or not, people incriminate themselves as to some past behaviors with certain words. And if you keep poking, that's a sweater. You're going to pull on that string and it's going to come out. But that request for approval with his chin down, and that emphatic push out. Oh, by the way, this, when he's saying no, could be a, hey, I've been prepared for this question and here it is. I, all these pieces together, I would sh certainly give him a little more scrutiny and attention. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, my first note here is this is the question he's been preparing for. <laughs> yep. And my second one is distancing verbal and nonverbal behavior. I saw her from a really big distance and I saw someone inside the house, made sure it's inside the house. So it couldn't have been me. I saw a person that couldn't have been me because they were inside the house and I wouldn't have been able to recognize them. Not I didn't recognize them, not I couldn't recognize them. If it was an imaginary scenario, that's when a person would say I would not have been recognize them because that's assuming that it didn't happen. I wouldn't have been able to recognize them. And, or I wasn't would be a, tr a truthful answer. And right there's an immediate flash to internal dialogue. The eyes go down. There is no hesitation. What, what we interrogators would call latency, like the end of a question, the beginning of a response. And his baseline suggests that he would shake his head and offer a simple, not a compound answer. So this compound answer is different from most of his baseline behavior. And that's all I got. Excellent. On one occasion while she was in residence in the cottage, I saw a person inside the house at some considerable distance. I wouldn't have been able to recognize them, known who they were. So did you ever meet her? No, I didn't ever meet her. All right. Well, uh, why don't we kind of throw it around the room, see what we got. We'll start with Mark, go to Chase, and then Greg. So, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I just think he has a basic misunderstanding of what irony might be. And so, you know, for that, for that reason alone, I don't quite uh, trust him. That, that's, all, that's all I'll say about that. Chase, what do you got? I think we see a lot of deception indicators here. I won't say that there is a lie or a murder that took place and this is the person that did it, but there are a lot of red flags 
And there are more red flags than I have seen on average. Uh, even talking to people who are actually later convicted, I see more red flags here than I would see in a case where we would later have a conviction. Greg? So number one, famous Irish poets who don't understand irony. That's I'll take that category for nothing. Right? Number one. <laughs> There's number one. But let's just walk through. The guy is weird. I mean, he's quirky in his behavior. We know that if you go and look, he walked around town dressed like some you know pirate. A one woman described him looking like a pirate, whatever. So he's, he's odd. Does odd mean that somebody murdered someone? No. He beat his wife. Does that mean he murdered someone? No. But all this other stuff. Now, what I'm going to tell you is the only way you get to know if he murdered someone is forensic evidence or confession. The rest of it, we're conjecturing. The rest of it, that's it. So what we would do is all these red flags that Chase is talking about as an interrogator, those are levers. The minute I see a weakness, I'm going to flip it open his little control panel and push a few buttons, close it up and go back to work. He's got a lot of them. He needs approval at a lot of turns, and we would certainly give him approval. Here, what I see is enough red flags to make me go, hmm, I'd love to talk to this guy. Not, did he kill her? But, hmm, I'd love to talk to him. See, is he just so wacky that he doesn't understand that he's using the word incorrectly? Or was that intentional? Was that a tool? There's a lot of reasons to want to talk to him, and I'd love to. Scott, what do you got? Uh, from video one to this last one, all we're seeing is just multiple multiple things that we that we train with and we say hey look for this 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 and this look for this this and this we're seeing all those things in here from the way he's speaking to his delivery to uh, the way he ends these things a lot of times and i think we're seeing um like i said before malignant narcissist and i think that is obvious here and if you wonder what they're like and how they act and all that go watch this go watch this go watch this thing on netflix because you're you're that's what you're dealing with. That's what you're dealing with here. And I agree with you guys. There, there are more red flags in this thing. Yeah, it, it's unbelievable. It's just like one, two, three. If, it, if we had a little ding, ding sound every time it happened, you couldn't hear the guy talk. There'd be so many things going on. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. What are you going to say, Greg? Go back and compare him to Castellano. He Many yeah. more red flags than Castellano had even. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you know that what? We should, we should remember that the French criminal court say that he did commit murder yeah so yeah. you know there, there's there's that i i don't know but they seem to know yeah they seem to believe it so there you and it. the psychologist who's read his journals seems to know he has some disorders so mm -hmm. all right all right fellas well that was another good one yeah. and uh i'll see you next time and we'll uh we'll watch uh right after this we'll watch greg jump around Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. Please subscribe to the Behavior Panel.